everyone to this uh, London branch meeting of uh, PSGB. Um, before we start, uh, if anyone's joined us late uh, and didn't hear uh, what we were talking about a little bit earlier, next week's meeting has been postponed to the following week. So there's no meeting of the London branch of PSGB next week. It'll be postponed to the following week. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ian Monday. Uh, Ian is a uh, a senior lecturer in educational philosophy in the School of Education at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And Ian is going to be speaking as, to us today on virtuosity and the singular voice in education. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak to you today. Um, uh, lovely to see everybody. Um, OK, uh, so I'll, I'll begin uh, by, by giving some reasons for uh, focusing uh, on virtuosity uh, and ed in education. So uh, why, uh, why, why did I decide to take this topic on? And uh, one, re one reason or one starting point would be to say that I've uh, twice been accused and uh, although possibly not complimented on uh, exhibiting virtuosity in educational contexts. So the first occasion uh, was by my uh, PGCE tutor, so uh, PGCE being a one year long teacher education course. Um, during a lesson I was giving on, on poetry and uh, the reason for uh, suggesting that this was a uh, virtuoso performance was on the grounds that I had uh, spent too much talk, uh, time talking myself and perhaps not enough time uh, listening to uh, what students had to say uh, about these poems. So here the, the, the notion of a virtuoso performance related to something which wasn't really, uh, which, which, was, which was all about me and what I was doing and not really taking into account what they were doing. Uh, the second occasion uh, came when uh, a chair, uh, following a talk that I gave during an emerging researchers conference, um, uh, in, during which I'd apparently made my fellow students, now quite how she knew this, I don't think she'd spoken to them, but all non-native English speakers feel inadequate in some way due to the breadth of vocabulary on display, as she saw it. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily <laughs> accept that description of what I was, uh, was talking about, although I think the, the criticism is something that, that, that one, should, uh, one should take seriously. So, uh, yes, I, I mean, in, in neither case do I think they were, that, that either person was really describing uh, what I was doing in um, complementary terms as a kind of uh, virtuoso performance. But I'm, what I'm interested in, in both those examples, um, is the kind of, both the critique and the backhanded use of the word virtuosity. So is there something in our culture, uh, educational and otherwise, that has caused us to turn against a concept that houses, uh, I suppose, barely conceals the word virtue. Are we perhaps in a kind of topsy-turvy world? And the question I have, which I'll return to later, or one question I have, which I'll return to later, is whether we might think that overcoming whatever blockages there are to virtuosity is itself a kind of educational uh, experience. So um, now I realize that I've been talking about virtuosity as though it was something that um, is necessarily familiar um, to, to, to everyone as, con uh, as a concept. And I suppose it, it might not be. It's not a word that's necessarily used that often, um, certainly, certainly now, I would, I would say. So uh, just to look at the dictionary definition or one dictionary definition, um, having looked at lots of dictionary definitions, they're not all the same. This one covers um, most of what, uh, roughly what, uh, how the word is, is understood. So it the, the first point there, it relates to music. So a virtuoso would be a consummate master of musical technique and artistry. Could also be a person who is a mastery or, or masterly or dazzling skill or technique in any field of activity. A connoisseur, a dilettante or collector of art objects. Um, a term, uh, a usage is apparently obsolete, where it means a scholar or a savant, um, and um, the, where the modifier comes in showing mastery skill or brilliance, you described as a virtuoso performance. Okay, 
Uh, and here's a quote from the uh, Merriam-Webster online dictionary that gives you a sense of the history of the word, which I'll, I'll suggest is interesting in some ways in a, in a, in a minute. So here, English speakers borrow the Italian noun virtuoso in the 1600s. It comes in turn from the Italian adjective virtuoso, which means both virtuous and skilled. In English, virtuoso can be pluralized as either virtuosos or virtuosi and is often used attributively a virtuoso performer. The first virtuosos were individuals of substantial knowledge and learning, so great, great wits, apparently, and the word was then transferred to those skilled in the fine arts, and by the 18th century, it had acquired its specific sense applied to musicians. In the 20th century, English speakers broadened virtuoso again to apply to a person skilled in any pursuit. So it's gone through quite a lot of changes. Okay, and the, the, the points of interest in this regard, I would su suggest, A, pertain to the way in which the word uh, precedes its capture within musical terminology before partially freeing itself and gaining a more general application. B, relate to the fact that the word uh, virtuoso begins life as an adjective in Italian, is taken up in English as both a noun and an extremely unusual adjective. So uh, in terms of, we can, we can say he is a virtuoso and we can talk about a virtuoso performance. So most adjectives can be attributive, so they precede the noun and predicative, follow it. So the green grass, where it's attributive, or the grass is green, uh, where it is predicative. But virtuoso can only be attributive. I think this is interesting because it implies that the performance belongs to someone, an attribution rather than simply describing something. Therefore, describing something as a virtuoso performance simultaneously praises both performance and performer at the same time in a way in which the two are peculiarly intertwined. Uh, attribution or praise is therefore enshrined in the use of the word. I think it's also interesting that the virtuoso can be one who appreciates or acknowledges virtuosity. This complicates things further in ways which I think are, are interesting, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, a bit later. Okay. So um, I looked for material in philosophy and philosophy of education on uh, virtuosity and education, and I didn't find very much. Uh, what I did find um, I didn't find especially, um, especially interesting. Uh, so uh, in terms of talking about what virtuosity might mean that extends or takes us beyond what we're looking simply at dictionary definitions, um, I, the most interesting thing I found was a, a panel discussion uh, at the uh, Townsend Humanities Centre in, in, in Berkeley uh, on, the, uh, on the question of virtuosity. And the people who participated in this were the music writer Ben Ratliff, the violist Kim Karkashian, Afro-Latin jazz musician John Santos, and associate professor of music and composer Ken Wayne. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so what, did the, what did they discuss? So I, I'm not going to sort of uh, attempt to draw upon their discussion to come up with some sort of set of criteria for what exactly virtuosity is, but I want to get a, give a flavour of the kind of thing that they discussed and draw upon that to, um, to explore things uh, further. So um, th they all seem pretty much in agreement that excellence as regards technique is an important part of it. Um, uh, Karkashian talks about reaching a point of technical excellence where the instrument ceases to be an obstacle, um, where she, she talks about the, uh, the occasions when she can eliminate resistance and is free to create and produce. However, the, the, the panel are in some disagreement over whether or not virtuosity comes about or can potentially as well come about through struggling with an instrument as you push it to its limits. Um, they talked about the difference between desire and intention. So uh, where, where intention seemed to be crucial to uh, whatever virtuosity consisted in, power of the will and a kind of directing of energy in some way. 
Uh, there was a broad agreement amongst them, however, that technical skills should only be seen as part of the picture. They discuss occasions in which dazzling demonstrations of skill can fall, can fall short. So uh, one of them uh, quoted Miles Dave, Miles Davis, who complained that uh, people were playing, uh, playing too many notes. You can see the, uh, the quotation there. Um, and another dimension of, of virtuosity, as they saw it, was about uh, a form of potent communication whereby one gets somehow gets into people's hearts and tells stories. The, the fifth point, which I think is perhaps, perhaps for me the most interesting one, uh, Kakashian describes the musical score as being uh, like a kind of architecture, like an empty building, one in which one can, which one can inhabit in one's own way. That, that voice seems to be uh, a, a central issue here. And that, uh, a virtuoso is someone, therefore, who inhabits sound. And uh, Wayno thinks of a, a lecture by B.B. Uh, King, so the, the well-known blues guitarist B.B. King. Uh, and what B.B. King does is that he, um, he demonstrates a um, playing, playing the blues, but playing, or playing the notes that you would play when you're playing the blues, so playing the A minor uh, pentatonic scale. Um, Millions of guitarists all over the planet can, can do this. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not terribly a difficult thing to do. Um, but what he does is he demonstrates just playing them and then shows what it looks like when he turns it on, if you like, when he inhabits the scale that he's playing, when he's uh, playing the blues. Um, when they discuss this issue, there's some disagreement over whether or not the word is appropriate in all musical context. Um, perhaps it's only appropriate to some musical genres. Um, this isn't said directly. There's a suggestion it might be an elitist word of sorts. And they consider whether or not, therefore, if you talk about virtuosity, it's culturally grounded. And lastly, they consider whether or not, um, or, or, or maintain that the virtuoso performance in some way sublimes criteria can stretch our sense of what music is. I uh, talk about confounding pre-existing historical values. Okay. So in thinking about that, I, wanted to, I, I, I considered how, um, how the experience of virtuosity might be in itself something that we would think of as, as, being, uh, as being educational. Uh, the example I've got there, I won't repeat the word, but it's the word that we used as teenagers to talk about um, spectacularly fast guitar playing that doesn't engage the audience. So uh, it's, it's a solo act that should uh, be kept away from, uh, from the public eye in some way. So, so, so yes, a lot of electric, very fast electric guitar music being played when I was younger. And this was a kind of the, a, a passionate sort of discussion that we would have about the about the value of this, you know, um, the, the, whether or not this really constituted music, whether or not it really engaged. So there was a sense in which um, something which had a only, as, as far as we could see it, uh, technical value to it, engaged us in a kind of in a kind of discussion. The sort of the sort of uh, passionate discussion that I wonder sometimes gets lost uh, on the way as we as we get older, become more more afraid, perhaps, of expressing our views. Um, I, I think of, I've, I've got fast bowling there on the slide. The reason for that is I remember hearing a discussion when I played cricket. Um, bowling is a kind of a form of throwing in the game of cricket for anyone who isn't familiar with it. Um, and uh, on the whole, uh, uh, cricket teams often involve um, uh, teenagers and men going up to uh, sometimes into their 70s. Uh, I, I won't explain <laughs> how and why that works. But a, a discussion I recall was to do with uh, to do with fast bowling, whether the fastest bowlers were the best ones, you know. And, and on the whole, the teenagers would think they were. And the kind of discussion that would move around that would be that that particular sort of particular kind of uh, technical dimension to things might not be everything that there was to something. So that virtuosity can therefore or the discussions of, of it can, can get us into this kind of discursive territory. 
Um, now, the, this idea that I mentioned before, the idea of inhabiting a building and, and, and uh, along with that, addressing an audience, might we say that the virtuoso performance leads us out um, in the sense of uh, educare or, or where, out of wherever we are and into the building. This comes about as a kind of, as a consequence of a potent form of communication. So perhaps that might be a way of thinking about, about what, what the virtuoso performance does. Um, and that maybe there is something also educational in the kind of in subliming of criteria, the confounding of pre-existing historical values. The experiencing virtuos virtuosity can unsettle us, it can shake us out of and away from our attachment to criteria in some way. Okay, and following on from that, I want to consider whether or not an analogy can perhaps be drawn between the virtuoso uh, musician and the virtuoso uh, teacher. Now, uh, there may be some disagreement as to what exactly um, a virtuoso teacher um, would consist in, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using this example because I feel it shines with what we've already, uh, already looked at in some way. So uh, the first lecture I'll describe, um, sorry, I'm so bad. Uh, let's call him uh, David, uh, delivered first year lectures to me uh, on, on Plato. And as uh, David took the stage, it was quite apparent that something special uh, was on the cards. He neither had to wait for or ask for silence. Moreover, if one rebelliously, for it felt like rebellion, glanced across the room, all eyes were on David. There was no whispering, no fidgeting. Instead, there was an almost sinister stillness. When he addressed the audience, it knew it was being addressed. The manner of delivery was direct, muscular, grandiloquent, uh, which I misspelled, utterly fluent and uh, evenly paced. As with actors of the old style, David's performance was uh, hyperbolic. He had a tendency to strut around the stage and perform dramatic and signal pauses following a profound remark or observation. While style, um, though the world's word feels inadequate, was certainly a feature of his performance. Um, and we'd probably be mesmerized if we'd sang Mary Had a Little Lamb on loop. Other things came to me when I recall these experience. Um, firstly, Plato's uh, Gorgias, which he was, uh, which we were looking at, a dialogue which had felt a little flat on reading, was animated. You were there in Athens with the sun burning on your back, privileged to be a spectator. I'm sorry, one sec. Um, to Socrates going about his extraordinary business. Moreover, Socrates was a plump, uh, charismatic Welshman. Uh, and for me, he still is. I should also add to this, this is a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. This is something that I feel I, feel I experience. Uh, but there was a round of applause after every lecture. Something which I think is, then was, then was extremely uncommon and, and still, would be, still would be now. Okay, so can, can an analogy be drawn between what I've described there and the, uh, between, uh, and the virtuoso musician that we talked about before? I think that maybe what David exhibits may have much in common uh, with what is said about virtuosity by the panel of musicians relating to direction of energy, inhabiting a building, in this in this case, Plato's text, I would suggest, is the, is the architecture which is inhabited in some way. Um, and that therefore taking one into that building by a, a potent form of communication. One difference perhaps there might be, um, the teacher may not sublime the criteria of philosophy as the musician does with music or extend its possibilities. Rather that the extension applies to the act of teaching, I think, in this case. Okay. Um, one way of um, perhaps thinking about, about virtuosity in education and, and adding to this picture and, uh, in some way is to consider um, 
what Stanley Cavell has to say about the uh, about the passionate utterance. And um, to understand or to get a sense of what the passionate utterance is, I'm going to briefly take you through what performative utterances are, and then say something about passionate utterances and connect this to the discussion in some way. So performative utterances uh, do things with words. So they involve uh, illocutionary verbs, he calls them, such as promise and marry. So these make sense in the first person uh, present indicative active. So you can say, I promise, uh, or I now declare you uh, a husband and wife, and you've done something in, 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 in saying it. So these are words where you do, or sentences rather, where you do something in the saying of them. Um, there are, however, criteria which must be in place for them to be happy. So a set of felicity conditions. So for example, if someone isn't qualified to marry people, then marriage doesn't happen. So certain kind of criteria or conditions have to be in place. A passionate utterance, on the other hand, um, relates to the realm of the perlocutionary or what is done by words. So this is, I, I should have mentioned that this, that the uh, discussion of the formative utterance is most famously appears in J.L. Austin's how to do things with words. So, um, and, and Cavell attempts to extend uh, that discussion um, or consider the ways in which something's been left out of it uh, because Austin doesn't, doesn't really look at the perlocutionary realm, what's done by words. So what do we mean by something being done by words? So um, uh, perlocutionary verbs might include uh, seduce, frighten, inspire, or move. So they don't make sense when used in the first person present indicative active form. So you can't say, I frighten or seduce or inspire or move you. It doesn't make sense to say it. Because whether or not I frighten, seduce, inspire or move you depends not just on what I do, um, though to do these things would require talent of some sort, but on your response to it. So responding therefore to the voice that is trying to engage you is to participate in what he calls improvisations in the disorders of desire. And through that participation, this is how you find your voice in some way. So in responding to the voice that um, confronts you through this, this is how you come to find your own. What seems to be important for Cavell is though one's reactions to the passionate utterance may be hospitable or not. The important thing, and I think he's, this is what Cavell sees as an important part of our moral education, is not to ignore it. Um, that ignoring passionate utterance is really what leads to its, its infelicity. And in the book, uh, Philosophy of the Day, the Philosophy of the Day After Tomorrow, with which the discussion of passionate utterance comes, um, it's a book that's littered with figures whose behavior might be regarded as virtuosic and who are ignored. So for example, Fred Astaire in the film Bandwagon walks or dances down the station platform and nobody notices it. There's an implication in another scene from that film in which Cavell gestures towards the unacknowledged debt to, uh, owed to black dancers in the history of American dance. So this is also about virtuosity ignored. Uh, talks about the way in which Shakespeare's achievement is diminished by literary critics who historicize it, proclaim the death of the author somehow. Um, and Cavell's own acknowledgement um, in a chapter with the same title as the book, where he notes that he's been blinded to the seriousness of Jane Austen's fiction in a chapter about untimely figures for the day after tomorrow. So there's something about um, the way in which uh, a certain kind of address, the, an address which comes to you forcefully, uh, directly, expressively, uh, can be ignored, not seen. So I think, um, yeah, to summarize a little bit some of the things I said, the, the, the virtuoso performance is an exemplary instance of passionate utterance in some ways. We find our own voice in response to the call of what is virtuosic, but there are reasons why we might ignore the voice that calls us. And some of these reasons I think are as old as the hills, whereas others are more recent. So 
let us uh, explore these now. Okay, uh, so uh, the uh, the picture on your uh, on the screens is a picture of a uh, of a siren uh, from uh, from the Odyssey by by Homer. So uh, for, for those if anyone unfamiliar with the the Odyssey. Um, uh, the Odyssey features the character Odysseus, who is um, trying to return home to uh, home to Ithaca, where he where he is king. And uh, on his journey, he encounters uh, various uh, various monsters. Uh, one of these being uh, the sirens. So the sirens are, are are sea monsters that wait on rocks for sailors to come along, and they sing. They are virtuosos or, or virtuosi, if you like. So um, uh, what, what Odysseus does is, and uh, I think this is kind of interesting, he, he, he takes wax and he stuffs his crew's ears with wax so that they can't hear the song of the, um, of the, of the sirens. And because uh, he's been instructed by uh, a witch on an island before he gets there that he should, he should listen to the, the song, but insists that he be strapped to the mast whilst he whilst he listens. And as the, um, as the boat sails past, the sirens call out, and you can see the quotation there, um, come hither as thou fairest, renowned Odysseus, great glory of the Achaeans, to stay thy ship, that thou mayest listen to the voice of us too. For never yet has any man rowed past this isle on his black ship until he has heard the sweet voice from our lips. Nay, he has joy of it, and goes his way a wiser man. For we know all the toils that in wide Troy, the Argives and Trojans endured through the will of the gods. We all, we know all this. Uh, sorry, I can't, due to, we know all, here we go. Endured through the will of the gods, we know all things that come to pass upon the fruitful earth. Okay, sorry, I was trying to move the pictures around. Okay, um, so, I think that the siren story perhaps tell us tells us something about what um, what may be within our culture deep down we fear and and are perhaps attracted to about about virtuosity in some way. But this partly perhaps relates to the idea that virtuosity may be some form of uh, seduction uh, against um, which uh, we may want to resist or hide from in some kind of way. So. Perhaps there's a fear these days too, um, within contemporary culture, that represents a fear of seduction per se. Perhaps we're coming to equate seduction with abuse, uh, particularly abuse by, by men, and reasonably so in many uh, uh, cases. Uh, I think, uh, if you think about the way in which people meet each other these days, uh, that the um, that the dating app can perhaps bypass seduction altogether. You know, um, swipe right, swipe left, and um, yeah, we, we can perhaps avoid that. Therefore, um, is there something within within how education is thought about that marries with this in a, in more or less sophisticated? With, with, with perhaps a suspicion of seduction, I mean, in a more or less sophisticated form. How, how might this perhaps relate to the virtuoso lecturer described above? Does he in some way seduce his audience? And um, the, the three things that I want to consider in regards to that, look at perhaps the dangers of charisma, um, might the way in which uh, David invites you into his building be an obstacle to what Beaster calls um, subjectification? So becoming, uh, becoming an individual. And is there also perhaps something um, overly intrusive about the kind of lecture that I described before? You know, uh, Jan Maskelein talks about putting something on the table. Perhaps uh, David, the lecturer I described, uh, turns you into a baby and feeds you somehow. There is something intrusive about this particular kind of 
way of teaching, way of communicating that may stifle um, the kind of independence that might be that might be desirable. Um, in regards to the art, to, 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 to concerns with charisma, um, one should, of course, be wary of charisma. Um, I would argue that David's performance extends beyond this because of the way in which it inhabits strong architecture. I, some, I wonder if perhaps the charismatic performances of experts, self-help gurus, and um, indeed the sirens that I've mentioned before, tend to lack this architecture. The sirens are, are lying to us, aren't they? So perhaps that is what the difference is. Although, of course, if there is one form of virtuosity that perhaps hasn't gone underground, it's, it's the kind of uh, TED Talk, self-help guru version of it, perhaps. Um, so as, as regards problems of, to do with subjectification or putting something uh, on the table, the notion that the sort of virtuosic teaching um, described when discussing David's lecture, it, it, this might somehow take over the student, confine them, prevent them from finding their own way. These are serious questions, I think. Though David does not possess the magical powers of the sirens, the invitation that he offers is seductive. There is a kind of magic in it, perhaps. It might be difficult to refuse. And when you have been taken into David's building, it might be hard to find your way out. So these might be all you know, serious questions that we could consider here. Um, I don't want to deny these challenges or I don't want to or ignore them, but I want to respond with uh, another, another tribute of sorts to another, um, to another lecturer. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just... This time. Uh, the most significant experience, as I see it, during my undergraduate education was uh, facilitated by a lecturer who was not popular. Let's call him Pete. He didn't command the room. He got into arguments with himself whilst lecturing that confused everybody. He made philosophy look very difficult. He provided us with a reader to go along with his lectures, which included his own introduction. And both the introduction readings felt impossibly hard when he first encountered them. But I found that if I read them over and over again, and I started to work my way through the murk without it ever clearing exactly, and whilst this was happening, I started to connect my struggle with Pete's possibly uh, theatricalized struggle. I'm, it's hard to know if Pete was doing it deliberately, but I was witnessing on stage every week. I came to think through this experience that David might be a fraud it was all too smooth and macho. So the first lecturer that I described might in some, way, some, some ways be a fraud. But years later, I felt guilty and ungrateful. And why? Um, sorry. Pete. Perhaps it is because you have to inhabit the house before you can see that things are not so neatly arranged. David's gift, which I had uh, denied, had involved opening the door to that house. Peter's gift, however intentional or unintentional, had been to show the muck and the mess hiding in the corners in some way. Uh, so to give another, um, it, it's, what I'm trying to get here is, is the way in which um, I had uh, disowned the virtuosic uh, performance in some way. That uh, philosophy, that uh, what um, Pete showed me was that philosophy is difficult, impossible to really um, master in some way. These were, were, were valuable lessons, but in the process, that kind of smoother um, experience or uh, <laughs> utterly smooth experience, which David had offered, came to seem false in some way. But I think that I had, um, that there was something um, morally wrong with the way in which I dismissed that in, 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 in ways which I think were significant. 
the, you'll see that the last bullet point on my slide says passionate utterance, Churchill and my gran. Um, the reason that this came to mind was partly because of the kind of the, the press that Churchill has had recently um, and, you know, notions about removing his statue, this kind of thing. And it, it took me back to a conversation that I had um, with my gran years ago, uh, following a documentary that had appeared on television called Heroes, in which Churchill was a hero or was presented as a hero. And I had done a bit of research on Churchill and found all sorts of pretty terrible things about him, uh, not just related to uh, possible racist accusations, but I mean, Churchill's history before the Second World War is uh, littered with uh, many uh, uh, mistakes and disasters. Uh, and I put this to my gran, who had lived through the war, um, that Churchill was not a hero at all. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone get so angry in my life. And what I put this down to was that she was still seduced in some way. She'd been there and that kind of seduction was still, um, was still, was still with her. And, and now I've, I think I'm wrong just as much as I think I was wrong in the way in which I responded to my, um, or to, 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 to David's lectures. Um, in the sense that what perhaps is, was Churchill's remarkable achievement was the way in which he managed to um, give the kind of performance which unites, brings together, brings people together into a particular idea, the architecture perhaps in this case being a particular notion of England or Britain, one that we may not want to have much time for now in all sorts of respects, but that, that to not acknowledge that, to not see it, to, you know, it seems to me to be problematic in, in, in or deeply problematic in certain, in certain respects. Okay. Um, other, other responses to, to, the, to, to the kind of, or other critiques, or responses to critiques of, of, of David's um, lecture, or lecture, way of lecturing. Now, are we in danger of ignoring something humanly rich about the experience of the passionate invitation or seduction. You know, note the ways in which Odysseus blocks his men's ears up and insists on listening himself. He still got, has to hear the sirens in some way. He's seduced before he even gets there and he welcomes it. Um, it in, in, in regards to this issue as well, I, th I think about um, a, a particular teacher that I used to work with when I was a school teacher. And um, one one evening, one parents' evening, um, there, was, there was there was there was nobody I, I nobody to see any of us in in in, in English anymore. They'd all uh, they'd all they'd all we'd seen everyone who was there to come, and so I went downstairs and saw this absolutely enormous queue um, extending to uh, one of the other teachers' uh, rooms, uh, one of the one of the classics teachers. Um, we, had, we had classics teachers in my school, even though it was a, in a very deprived area of Rotherham because it had been a grammar school once and they had uh, kept their classics teachers because they were thought to be so good. Um, right, I think. Um, but uh, another ch child walked past me and I said, why is there such a huge queue for them and there isn't a queue for every everybody else? What's going on? Um, and he said, said it was it was two things. One, it was that he had uh, sorted them out um, when they were younger, I think sometimes through barely um, what we now think is quite barbaric means. He said it, it's that and the wonderful stories he used to tell. And um, what it made me think about was that, uh, that in a way I knew the answer to the question before I even asked it, that because I'd done the same thing. I'd stood outside his room and a number of other teachers had done the same thing to hear those stories. We were drawn there, we were pulled into it somehow. And the, 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 the power of that seems to me to be something that to, you know, and, and this was a teacher who had, had once been regarded as wonderful by the school inspectors, now was seen as being terrible. How could, how could, you, how could you measure that? What sort of, you know, going into a room looking for criteria for it? It, it somehow doesn't work. But the way in which he, th this, uh, the kind of performance that he, he gave brought this crowd to his door still. 
It made me think a little bit as well about the film uh, Armadeus, based on uh, the play by uh, Peter Schaffer. There's a great bit in it where um, yes, the, the court composer Salieri is, uh, is teaching the king um, uh, the piano, and the king is trying to learn his piece, and the Mozart shows up and then starts improvising on his piece. And you see that the doormen who are standing outside are unable to remain outside the door. They are pulled in to, um, to hear what it, what it is that is going on. Um, now, another way of, of, of thinking about this is that perhaps um, an education from, from virtuosity in some way, maybe, maybe that's the right way to put it, can be put on the table in a way rather like, you know, in the kind of way that maybe um, Masculine's way of thinking of this would, would accept. I think of um, an ex uh, a couple of examples. One would be um, something that the viola player in the panel discussion I mentioned earlier, uh, Karkashian talks about, where she, um, when asked if she's ever um, used the, the, this example of a house that one inhabits in some way to, with her students, she thinks of a case where she would, um, she took her uh, Chinese uh, uh, viola students to a Matisse exhibition. And um, what, what was interesting about the exhibition was that you had uh, paintings with the objects that were painted next to them. And the students could see the ways in which the painting inhabited the object, did something different with it. And that her message to the students was that this was how they could think of the music that they were playing in some way, for it not to necessarily be the same thing from day to day, but it was something that you went into, that you inhabited. Uh, Adrian, how am I doing for time? Yeah, uh, you're okay, Ian. Um, five, 10 more minutes, that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so an another um, situation that might involve putting virtuosity on the table in some way, um, that I, I think of something that I do with my um, English students. Um, so I, I, I teach students to become English teachers as, 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 as part of my job. And uh, they, 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 they teach something uh, called the Leaving Cert in Ireland, which is the kind of equivalent of A-levels, I suppose, here. Um, and uh, part of that involves teaching film. And a lot of them haven't studied film or, or taught it before. So um, one of the things that I, that I do with them, um, and uh, it pleases them because it, um, it seems to be something practical in, in, in their eyes that I'm doing, is that I get them to create a, a chart with a series of film techniques down the side. And then they have to talk about the experience that the technique generates and how it generates. So they fill in a kind of table. And um, but what I find most educationally valuable about this is not that particular process is that I show that they have to look at lots of films, extraordinary films from the past or clips of them to see how these techniques are used. And, and if you actually watch this process, you, you move from clip to clip, it, it's an extremely woozy and unsettling experience because you see the, the multiple ways in which the, the world can be um, become a different sort of, um, or in which its architecture can take thing, can take a different kind of viewpoint or perspective, I guess. That would be another example, perhaps, of how virtuosity might in some way be put on the table in which one can sort of see the voice emerge. Okay. So, um, one of the, the, the first obstacle that I, I, I talked about in regards to virtuosity in education related to uh, seduction and how we might respond to that. Um, the next obstacle that I think might be, or think is interesting to look at, is this notion of a word that's, that's used a lot, I think, uh, but particularly by people younger than me, the notion of something being relatable in some way. So, um, I think about uh, my younger relatives who I once heard having a discussion about some reality television program that they were watching, uh, which I think involved people sitting around on an island or, so, or something like this, um, possibly trying to um, get off with each other. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it was. Anyway, um, 
and that they, they talked about how the, the people on this program were, that some of them were doing well. And I, I asked them what it, doing well meant. And it se there seemed to be a, a performance whereby one tried to be as mediocre as possible to therefore be relatable. So that therefore expressing um, a lack of knowledge on almost any matter whatsoever would in fact endear you to the audience in some way. So I thought, well, what's, what's going on with that? And then I, I thought about the program, uh, the popular program on television um, called uh, Strictly Come Dancing, uh, a, a program in which the, uh, the main focus is on the people who can't dance very well. So you have a program where with people who are um, virtuoso performers of sorts, but the program is all about watching the journey of some minor celebrity or other as they improve their dancing. But consequently, when you watch the dancing on the screen, the person you watch is the one that can't really do it very well. And I think there's something, um, there's, there's something fascinating about that, the way in which virtuosity is hidden as a consequence of it. Um, yeah, as regards politics, um, well, perhaps we are in a situation where um, picking the most unimpressive candidate you can find as some sort of antidote to the most impressively offensive thing that you've already got, maybe the thing that's going on here. This might not be something related just just the recent American election, although perhaps I'm, you know, uh, taking an overly political um, stance here, but we, we go back to uh, when George Bush Jr. became uh, became president of the United States, uh, Al Gore was uh, thought to have been uh, bullying him due to his sort of lack of understanding of politics. And, and, and Gore was, if you like, showing what might have been regarded as a sort of virtuosity. Um, so to talk about how this, this, this notion may play into, uh, into education, I, I, I want to um, consider uh, an example of a discussion that I, or a position that one of my former colleagues, who was the PE or the, the expert in, or the, in physical education, the last uh, place I worked in. And uh, he had a mantra and his mantra was, uh, PE or physical education has nothing to do with sport. So you might, um, you might think that, that sounds rather unlikely. It might be like, a bit like saying um, history has nothing to do with the past or, 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 or something along those lines. But what he meant by that was that, um, that the focus on sport was alienating to students in some way. They watched their peers, some of whom would uh, perhaps show some degree of virtuosity in um, in the sport that they were playing, and that this would that they would feel inadequate in some way. That the, as a consequence of this um, inadequacy, that they would um, the feeling of inadequacy rather, they would therefore not take up physical exercise later in life. That they would um, uh, therefore be more likely to become ill, and that consequently making physical education, getting rid of the sport aspect of it, and creating lots of um, games that involve physical exercise but no real competition or obvious display of skill was seen as being um, the way to go to be inclusive. In some ways that sounds like it might be quite persuasive. After all, there are all sorts of reasons why we would want a, a healthier older population and if, if what he describes is right or true, maybe we should take this seriously. How to respond to it? I want to respond to it um, uh, indirectly at first. So uh, I want to respond to it uh, by, uh, with reference to a story by uh, Kurt Vonnegut. So uh, a story called Harrison uh, Bergeron. Uh, so this is how the story begins. Uh, the year was 2041 and everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law, they were equal every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. And all this equality was due to the 211th, 212th and 213th amendments of the constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of the United States Handicapper General. So what happens in the, so the, the story that begins this way focuses on a couple, George and Hazel. And we're told that their son Harrison had been taken away at a young age, but we're not told why um, initially. The couple are watching dancers on television. 
Chances are uglified by hideous masks so no one can feel bad about themselves when looking at them. They're dancing badly, partly because of the bags of bird shot around their necks that prevent them from doing it well. George starts to think that the dancing isn't very good, but then a siren goes off in the uh, legally enforced appendage attached to his head and the thought disappears. The dancers then stop and one delivers a disturbing message. When doing so, she deliberately changes her melodious voice to a, quote, grapple squawk. She announces that the prisoner and son of George and Hazel, Harrison Bergeron, has escaped. Uh, he'd been in prison as a consequence of his uh, unacceptable levels of strength and ability. If you see him, warned the dancer, uh, whatever you do, don't try to reason with him. Shortly afterwards, uh, Harrison appears on the screen. He's broken into the studio. He sheds his handicaps, handicaps, declares himself emperor, and requests that one of the ballerinas dance with him. They float to the ceiling and kiss passionately before being shot down by the handicapper general, Diana Moon Blampers. At the end of the story, George, who had left the room briefly and missed some of this, comes back in to find uh, his wife uh, crying. He says, um, what, what, what happened? He says, she says, um, I, I don't remember, something very sad on television, I think. I think what, what Vonnegut's story uh, shows us or is, is, is looking at in some ways is what perhaps could happen when inclusion is entirely co-opted by centripetal forces, by which I mean forces which drive everything inwards towards a, towards a centre. But this is perhaps what's been going on in, 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 in this culture of um, where, where, where things have to be relatable in some way. Um, and we can perhaps think the dance where, they, where, where the couple rise up from the floor could be almost the, the release of repressed centrifugal forces within the culture somehow. Um, notably, the society depicted by Vonnegut is one in which there are no voices. Um, in which voice is repressed entirely. Is it are we worth considering that perhaps our society um, is on the way towards something like this? With all that in mind, I don't want to write off what my former colleague was, was saying about, um, about inclusion, if you like. Perhaps, but one way of looking at it is perhaps PE might have something to do with sports some of the time. That one can have a situation where, um, where you have all sorts of activities which are not competitive, which do not show one up for not being able to do something. But, um, but, but also the, the, the experience of virtuosity may be important, um, important in some ways too. But when I first heard Will, uh, my, my, my colleague, former colleague, express the argument that he expressed, um, I felt a mixture of things. Uh, the, the, the first thing that I felt um, was uh, remembering the envy I had for people who seemed to do things uh, sporting-wise so naturally and easily. And the second thought was how terrible it would be not to have witnessed it somehow, not to have been party to it. So uh, just uh, concluding remarks, Earlier in the paper, I raised the question of whether or not the word virtuoso to describe um, a performer or a performance is necessarily appropriate. Perhaps it's elitist in some way. But my feeling, and this turns to its odd history and grammar, is that it is a word inscribed with praise, and extending it as widely as possible uh, is a good thing. As regards problems with virtuosity, I've tried to show some of the ways in which the virtuoso performance may be problematic. But I've also argued for ways in which acknowledgement of it may be an important part of both anaesthetic and moral education. Okay, uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Um, so, um, 